Okay, good morning everybody and uh, welcome to our webinar. The, the title is uh, Steps for Success with the RNAscope Multiplex Assay. So um, the agenda will be as follows. So first of all, I will present an overview of the RNAscope technology and the assay workflow. Then I will go through the experimental design and the assay setup with the RNAscope Multiplex Fluorescent Assay. I will give you some tips to, on how to get success started and successful, and also a few tips on uh, for troubleshooting. I will quickly go through um, some guidelines to combine RNAscope staining with immunofluorescence, and then I will also introduce our new assay, the Multiplex Assay version 2, with some uh, workflow information characteristics and some uh, uh, pictures of the staining. So first of all, for those that are not familiar with the uh, RNAscope technology, I will go through the principle and the workflow of the technology. So the RNAscope in situ hybridization is a specific and sensitive method to detect RNA biomarkers in cells and tissues with the morphological context. Um, the hybridization and signal amplification system is based on a unique probe design that gives simultaneous signal amplification and background suppression. So the probe design, we designed uh, probes that are sets of Z oligonucleotides. Those Z oligonucleotides work as pairs. And I will go through um, the detail of how it works on the next slide. So <clears throat> with these pairs, um, there's a preamplifier molecule that binds to these uh, pairs of oligonucleotides allowing a specific signal amplification. We have uh, multiple assays that allows chromogenic detection and fluorescent detection. Um, the, the technology allows single RNA molecule detection. You can detect um, several up to four um, RNA markers. We have, as I said, fluorescent and chromogenic readouts. Um, you can have direct visualization of messenger RNA on non-coding RNA cells and tissues. And the assay is very flexible and you can basically use it on uh, numerous tissue sample types, FFP, fresh frozen, fixed frozen, cultured cells, and also on free floating and whole mount as well. <clears throat> so the RNA scope uh, workflow is as follows. So basically the assay is run as uh, you would run an immunofluorescence or an immunohistochemistry. So the tissues on slides are permeabilized, mm -hmm. and then there is uh, amplified uh, hybridization of the of the uh, target of the probe to the target RNA. Sorry, and then there is a cascade of um, uh, hybridization event that amplified the signal, and then the signal is visualized as dots, and those dots can can be quantified because each dot represents one RNA. So this is how it works. So the principle is like we have robustness through redundancy. So basically, even if your RNA is degraded or has or is partially accessible because there's RNA binding protein bound to it, you will still be able to detect it. So if it's only when two Z pairs are bound to each other to your target RNA that it creates a binding site for a preamplifier molecule. So if only one Z is bound, or one Z is bound unspecifically to any other RNA of the transcriptome, there will be no uh, binding site for the preamplifier that is created, and therefore no amplification of the signal. So no unspecific uh, signal. When, so when two Z bound adjacent to each other to the target RNA, then the preamplifier can bind, and then through the cascade of hybridization events, you have the amplifier molecule and then the label probe. So with the RNAscope technology, you actually need only three times, three pairs of Z bound to your RNA to create a signal dot. So the reason why we provide uh, our standard probes as 20 Z is to create robustness. So now I'm going to go through uh, the multiplex fluorescent assay, set up an experimental design. So the multiplex fluorescent assay allows you to detect the current platform, allows you to detect up to three targets simultaneously. 
So, <clears throat> and for, 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 for this, you're going to need three different probes in three different channels. Let me go back quickly to this, sorry. So basically, a channel is the binding site for the preamplifier. So if you want to visualize several targets simultaneously, you're going to need different um, uh, preamplifiers and different binding sites in order to distinguish the signal from the different probes. So <clears throat> you have, in order to do this, you have to assign your probes to the three different channels, taking in consideration that the channels do have different um, uh, characteristics and also um, different strengths. The channel two being the least, so being less strong than the two others. So basically, if you want to, ha if you have a low express target on a target where you don't know the expression level, we usually recommend to put it in the C1 channel. So that's the first uh, variable of the assay. The second variable is the fluorophore. So the assay is very flexible and comes as with three alternatives of the M4. The M4 is basically the mixture of fluorophore. So then you're going to be able to play around with the color and the channel, making, uh, allowing you to change the color di between different experiments or if you are experiencing issues in one channel or not. So <clears throat> in order to uh, start, obviously we um, uh, recommend to use the recommended sample preparation that I usually provide in Europe. Uh, we recommend to use the pro uh, gold antifade anti for uh, optimal signal detection, that's the mounting medium. Um, we also uh, recommend to be aware of the suggested filter settings for your microscope. And uh, when necessary, you can also have a channel assessment slide that ACD provides, which is a slide that is already stained, HALA cells that are already stained with the three alternatives of M4. <clears throat> so this is uh, the assay workflow for the fresh frozen tissue sample. So this is an example of the staining you would obtain if you would use the M4 alternative A. So your C1 channel will be in green, your C2 in orange, which is actually red, um, C3, and the um, uh, um, C3 channel will be in far red. So basically for a uh, fresh frozen tissue sample, you have uh, snap frozen your tissue and then uh, cut your sections uh, with a cryostat. Then you can you fix your sections with cold PFA and then you do a protease treatment to permeabilize the cells. Then you hybridize your um, uh, probe for two hours at 40 degrees. Then amplification of the signal with M1, M2, M3, and M4 where you choose among the three alternatives. Then you counter stain with DAPI and you mount your slide with prolonged gold antifade. For fresh frozen tissue samples, the assay is very straightforward. It lasts about six hours. So how to get started and successful? So first of all, as I say, we, we recommend to um, we please use the recommended sample preparation protocol for optimal reasons. And we also have suggested pretreatment conditions depending on your tissue sample. We always recommend to run the three-plex positive control and negative control to validate your tissue samples and assess the RNA quality, and also verify your microscope settings. And on top of the, on top of this, it also allows you to get used to the uh, RNA scope signal that is uh, different from uh, immunofluorescence signal that you may be used to. So basically, here are the four steps. You check all the material you you need to for the experiment. You validate your tissue sample, you optimize your condition when it's necessary, and then you test your probe. We always recommend to also evaluate the results by eye, so you should be able to see dots um, at 20x or 40x with a DP fluorescent microscope. And um, for optimal signal detection, use prolonged antifade, as I just said. So here I'm going to walk through the, 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 the basic step of how to set up the assay. So we have what we call a route to success. Basically, you have to verify the, the integrity of the RNA in your tissue sample by testing the, posit the positive and negative control probe. So for the uh, multiplex assay, we provide three-plex control probes, the three-plex positive control probes, the mixture, 
ready to use of three different um, uh, housekeeping genes that have three different levels of expression. It is very useful because it <clears throat> allows you to uh, adjust the setting of your microscope in the three channel and also evaluate how good the integrity of your RNA is. Basically, in some cases, where the RNA uh, um, integrity is compromised, you will be able to see the signal for ubiquitin, which is a high expressor. PPIB is a medium expressor, but sometimes pathway might be difficult. And this is a sign that if you want to detect a low express target, you might have difficulties because of RNA um, quality in your tissue sample. So <clears throat> you check the signal uh, in the three channel, also the cell morphology, if it's well preserved. If, if it's, this is passed, this pass, meaning that the PPIB score is above two, meaning four to nine cells, four to nine dots per positive cell, and the DAP, the DAP negative signal is uh, close to zero, less than one, meaning one dot every 10 cell is acceptable as negative control. And if it, pass, it passes, so, sorry, there's a three, but that's a two. Um, you can run the target probes. If it fails, then you need to verify the workflow, optimize the pretreatment, check the RNA quality, and ultimately maybe test a new um, um, tissue block. So this is, for example, an um, example of uh, step one, the validation of, of samples and assessment of RNA integrity with the triplex positive control in hippocampus. This is M4 alternate B. A mouse fresh frozen sample, 16 macro meta section, and 30 minutes protease for treatment. And then, so the assay pass morphology is, 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 is good. My IC signal in the three channels, does so I can move forward with my target probes. And this is what an example of what it is. Um, uh, mouse cannabinoid receptor one, mouse uh, dopamine receptor one. On the other side, uh, dopamine receptor 1 and 2 here in hippocampus, you see uh, um, cannabinoid receptor 1 expressed in pyramidal um, neurons, and, uh, and uh, uh, dopamine receptor expressed here in the hippocampus. And here in the striatum, you see dopamine receptor and uh, 1 and 2 differentially expressed. This was also done in mouse fresh frozen uh, brain, 60 micrometer section, and 30 a minute protease for treatment. So I'm going to uh, walk through some a uh, few tips of uh, troubleshooting with the RNA scope uh, multiplex fluorescent assay now. So <clears throat> there can be a great uh, impact of fixation and pretreatment condition, and this is illustrated here. So basically, um, Julie here will give me her uh, 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 picture made an experiment with what we call the standard condition that are uh, recommended in our protocol. She did a 15-minute fixation with cold PFA and 30 minutes protease for. She was not satisfied with the uh, morphology, with uh, the nucleus be being, um, the DAPI staining being weak, and the nucleus membrane being destroyed. So I suggested her to adjust those conditions, and she, she ran a longer fixation, and um, slightly uh, shorter protease for treatment. She didn't lose in signal uh, specificity and in, uh, in signal intensity, but uh, however, the nucleus were much better preserved. So th those parameters you can play around depending on what is your goal. Some people wish to detect as much as they can, so they, don't, they, they, they would compromise on cell morphology. Some other people want to have a nice morphology with an optimal um, um, detection. <clears throat> so here are other potential issues and solutions that you may have. So as I said, for nuclear morphology, you can adjust uh, the fixation time, 30 minutes to one hour, and also adjust the protease for conditions. The most frequent issue would be the autofluorescent background. The first step to, uh, to adjust is to rinse the uh, after fixation with 4% PFA is to rinse several times the slides with PBS in order to get rid of the uh, PFA residues that might create autofluorescence. Excuse me. 
So using the uh, recommended mounting media is also, uh, has also some effect on the quality of the signal. Uh, obviously, using a background adjustment software will help. Some, some um, w people working with fixed frozen tissue sample also may experience some background issues. In those cases, when it's possible, I recommend to prepare fresh frozen. And also what can help is also to increase the washes from, um, usually we recommend two times two minutes. If you switch to two to three times five minutes, it also helps. Another issue potentially can be the uh, signal fading. So we recommend to image the slide few hours after mounting, optimally at least three, eight hours. You mount your slides, you um, go home, and then you can image the next day. Um, we recommend to, um, to image at the very best with, within the next few days. The signal is stable for two to three weeks when the slides are still in the dark at four degrees. After this, you, the signal might disappear. So I'm going to show you now a few examples of the performances of the assay um, in neuroscience. So those experiments were done on a mouse fresh frozen brain. As I said, 30 minutes protein for treatment, 16 micron uh, section. So I'm going to show you a few examples of detection. Uh, no, the first title is obsolete. So I'm going to show you detection of mRNA um, where um, no uh, antibodies or no reimbalance antibodies are available. And um, this is this going to be a gPCR and also detection of long non-coding RNA. So here is an example of a detection of cannabinoid receptor, CNR1, and dopaminergic receptor 1 in hippocampus. You see that the signal is nicely distinguishable as dots. You can quantify those dots. When neuro, when neuron express extremely high level of cannabinoid receptor, then you cannot distinguish dots anymore. This is what we consider a cluster of signals. And uh, you, can, uh, you can run a semi-quantitative scoring of, um, of the signal. And I can uh, send you the guidelines if you wish. So this is another example, the same, the same image, but in another area. All right. This is also another example at the hippocampus of, uh, uh, sorry, my, sorry about that, cholinergic receptor, uh, muscarinic 3, and dopamine receptor 2. Those two receptors are known to have extremely challenging antibodies. So um, therefore, arenoscope is a good alternative when you want to detect those, uh, those uh, targets in tissue samples. So here is also an, ex uh, um, um, an example of detection of two long non-coding RNA. The slides are moving by themselves. I'm sorry about that. Uh, NIT1 and MALAT1 in mouse hippocampus. So uh, long non-coding RNA transcripts are usually uh, localized in nucleus, and this is what we observe here very nicely. This is also another example of ion channel detection, also that are known to have a challenging antibody. So sodium acid sensing ion channel, ASIC-1, and inwardly rectifying potassium ion channel, KCNJ6, in the hippocampus. So ASIC-1, very low expression level, but you can still distinguish nice dots. So uh, now after presenting those three examples, I'm going to go through quickly through um, guidelines to combine uh, RNA scope in the first. And so it's possible to um, to combine uh, RNA scope with immunofluorescence on IHC. So what we recommend, obviously, is first to establish RNA scope alone and make sure it works nicely. Uh, and oh, and sorry, it works nicely with your tissue sample and your target probe. And also, we recommend to work with antibodies that are known. You know the working condition, and you know that they are robust. So basically, this is how, how it goes. So you start with the RNA scope first. Then uh, after the signal detection, you wash two times uh, uh, with uh, PBS in, in case of the fluorescent assay. 
and you do not counterstain, but then you move directly to the immunofluorescent uh, protocol. You do not perform any additional pretreatment because the pretreatment of arenoscope would be sufficient for uh, your antibody detection. Then you block your sample, you incubate with primary and secondary antibody, antibodies, you counterstain and mount your slides, and again, optimally use prolonged antiphase. You might need to adjust the conditions such as the concentration of the antibodies, the arenoscope protease condition, and also you might want to consider signal detect uh, using TSA uh, to amplify the signal of immunostaining. So we do not provide a protocol to uh, perform arenoscope with immunofluorescence, basically because the variable, there is a high vari variability of the success of this combination, and it's highly dependent on the epitope itself and the antibody, basically the protease treatment of the assay, but not only this, also the incubation of the um, of the section with uh, the hybridization buffer that um, contains uh, detergent, and also the numerous temperature changes and washes is going to affect the integrity of your epitope, and each epitope uh, uh, and, um, respond differently to this to this um, um, ironoscope conditions. So you're going to have to play around a little bit with the condition. But some 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 uh, antibodies are very straightforward. You try it once and it's working. Some others are more challenging. But that's basically what it is with immunofluorescence in general. OK. So now that I've gone through the multiplex the current assay and the multiplex fluorescent, I'm going to introduce you to um, the multiplex fluorescent assay version 2, which is a manual assay. So the multiplex fluorescent assay comes, uh, sorry, there's a typo. You can multiplex up to three probes. Um, it works in combination with TSA reagents. The, the last uh, uh, step of the signal amplification is the TSA. For this, you're going to have to purchase the fluorophore from Perkin Elmer. We are recommend to use TSA plus. This is the list of the three fluorophore you will need, but when you run a, a manual experiment. Actually, you can purchase this this kit with this product number that contains all three fluorophore and, and smaller quantities. This will actually be a lot, uh, enough for, I would say, 50 to 100 sections. With this new fluorescent assay, there is a fourplex capability, and you can purchase also this fourplex ancillary kit. And for this, you will have to uh, use the Perkin um Opal 7 color kit that is a little more expensive than this uh, trial kit. So here are the kit components. So <clears throat> the multiplex, uh, manual multiplex kit, as I said, is the threeplex capability. It's, uh, it has been optimized for FFP tissue samples. This is definitely a new um, feature of this assay because this, the current assay is not optimal for FFP tissue sample because of autofluorescent issues. So it has improved signal intensity. The dots are brighter. And uh, the channels are balanced because of this TSA amplification. So you don't need to go through this channel ass assignment step. So here's the list of what uh, uh, is in the kit. It contains the detection kit, the amplifiers, and the DAPI. The universal pretreatment, the H202, the target retrieval, and the protease reagent. The TSA buffer is the solution where, that you need to dilute your um, TSA um, aliquot, and then the wash buffer. So now let me go through the uh, workflow and the principles of the assay. So the assay is longer. It lasts about um, 14 hours. This is the example for SFP tissue sample. It lasts 14 hours with an overnight step after um, after uh, probe hybridization. So basically, for FFP tissue sample, you bake your slides, you de paraffinize, you treat them with hydrogen peroxide, you uh, go through the target retrieval step with the hot plate and the steamer, and you permeabilize with protease plus. Then you hybridize with the mixture of probes. You stop overnight, you store your slide in 5 SFP, and then, and then start the 
uh, signal amplification. Then M1, M2, and M3 are common to the three channels, but then you have to do a sequential detection for each channel. So you basically first detect the signal of the C1 channel, you block, and then the C2 channel, you block, and then the C3 channel. You counterstain with TAPI, and you mount with prolonged gold amplifier that way. Please be careful that this is a new amplification system, and those amplifiers are absolutely not compatible with any other RNA scope amplifier. So basically, use the I use this TSA chemistry that I represented as a sketch here. So, <laughs> so here is the, the two Z probes, the two Z oligos that are um, uh, bound to your target RNA. You have this amplification of the signal with the pre-amplifier, the amplifier, and the last step, what is called in the workflow, is, sorry, this HRPC1, sorry, is this last step. And then after this last step, you um, use the TSA from perkin Elma. So basically, HRP catalyzes the formation of TSA free radicals. Then those TSA free radicals for, form covalent bond with tyrosine residues from proximal to HRP. And then you can wash the unbound TSA radicals from, from that form diamonds, and you can wash them with the wash buffer. So it's a, a very powerful extra amplification step of the uh, of the signal. Before on our current assay platform, it was direct fluorophore detection. So HRP here in the sketch that would be the fluorophore in the in the current assay platform. <clears throat> so here are the key features of this new assay. It has an improved signal intensity, brighter dots. The signal stand out from the autofluorescence of the tissue, especially it's especially useful for FFP tissue samples, and also low express marker or low uh, low expression uh, uh, RNA. The uh, probe assignment is more flexible. You do not need to go through this channel assignment for your uh, target, and there is no masking effect of the fluorescence with each other, so it's ideal for co-localization. You can also combine it with immunofluorescence, and you can use it for any tissue sample, cells, FFP, fixed frozen, and fresh frozen tissue. So I'm going to show you how, some examples of uh, some staining with this new assay. <clears throat> so this is uh, uh, the staining you uh, you will get with uh, mouse mouse fresh frozen brain and our um, positive control probe. This is mouse and rat in the third channel. Ubiquitin is in white, so uh, ubiquitin is a high expressor, so you get only a diffuse uh, staining uh, in our cells, uh, clusters of signal. This is another example of this time mouse brain FFP tissue center with some um, uh, um, neuroscience markers such as glutamatergic receptor 1 and 2, or here, cannabinoid receptor 1, dopamine receptor. <clears throat> so you see dopamine receptor in red. This is, this is low magnification. It's not that easy to, to see. I'm sorry about that. <clears throat> so higher magnification in mouse brain fresh frozen or rat fresh frozen, you see a uh, neuropeptide uh, receptor 2, which has a uh, rather low expression, uh, not low expression level, sorry about that. It's the, um, the five that are low, lower expression level, but you can dis nicely distinguish the, the signal in this case. And now, um, this is the biggest application of the, this new assay, FFP tissue sample. This was not possible or extremely challenging with the former or the current assay platform. Um, here's an example of head and neck cancer FFP samples with uh, three different probes, HR18, P16, and uh, MK, MK67. And here, a breast cancer uh, uh, tissue sample, keratin-19, PCAM-1, and MKS-67. You can nicely distinguish the signal and the different cell types that express the different targets. So here is also another uh, example of our uh, positive control probe on colon cancer. 
FFP tissue sample. And the last example I'm going to show you is mouse kidney FFP tissue sample. Kidney are known to be challenging. They have a very autofluorescence, and this um, can be difficult even with the current assay platform. And those problems are resolved um, with this TSA um, extra step of signal amplification. Okay, so now here's a summary of our uh, webinar today. So I went through the RNA-scope technology, um, how to uh, set up the assay with the RNA-scope multiplex fluorescent um, experiment. I went through the steps to uh, how to get started and successful. I gave you some few tips and tricks, troubleshooting, and I presented, I, I briefly presented the new uh, uh, assay that is called version two. So now I'm open to questions. So I will look through the chat. If you have any questions, just um, write them down. Normally, I'm able to see them. So the first question I see in the Q&A um, section is, um, you recommend protease 4. Uh, is this correct? Would that C not be better for the morphology? Um, and, um, um, yes, we recommend for fresh frozen tissue sample, we recommend protease 4. Uh, protease 3 has uh, about um, 1 to 5 to 2 times less concentrated. But using protease 3, you will uh, lose very much in signal intensity and sensitivity. So we still recommend to change the parameter of the incubation time, but not too much. If, if you, like 20 minutes seems to be also very good, but if you go lower, then you, you will lose in uh, signal um, efficiency and detection. Okay, um, then I see another question. <clears throat> Do you find any problems with the pH of sample uh, or DAPI when using pitch T as a label? <clears throat> oh, that's a good question. I think um, if, if, if the pH is too acid, then you're going to have problem with the stability of the amplification tree. So, yes. Is there, are there other questions? I'm not seeing the question, so Claudia, you're going to have to. <laughs> you need to look at the, in the Q&A uh, part, not in the chat part. So I, I have another one. Uh, will the assay work even for FFPE tissue with quite high autofluorescence, such as lung tissue? Yes, the new assay for sure. Yeah, definitely. This is the main um, application to it. So basically the current assay, was absolutely not recommended for FFP tissue samples. This is why we came out with this new version. Okay, then I have, um, hello, we would like to use RNA scope both on fresh and fixed frozen tissue, but after the boiling part, our samples disintegrate. How necessary is the boiling for the protocol? Um, so I've seen, so it's, 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 it's it's a common problem. So basically, this, you have to use the super frost plus slide. This is definitely a critical, um, uh, a critical uh, step. Uh, for fixed frozen tissue sample, sometimes reducing the temperature of the target retrieval might help without, without, uh, without compromising the signal efficiency. Um, I, I know some people who just kept it and increased the protease treatment. So if you face this problem, um, I would say contact me, and I will give you some tips to make sure that your tissue sample stays on the slide or to uh, adjust the pretreatment condition. What you can do with fixed frozen tissue sample is add a, a post-fixation step. So after you take your samples from the freezer, you, f you fix them in PFA again as you would do for fresh frozen. And this is going to help uh, preserve the uh, cell integrity and also 
um, yeah, preserve, uh, avoid detachment. Okay, then we have the next question. Um, to combine Aronoscope and IHC, is there any recommendation of staining for Aronoscope color? No. No, you do whatever you want. So if you if you have only secondary antibodies that are at XR4A8, then you switch to green channel or things like this. But no, not, absolutely not. Then we have another one. Are you able to take micro uh, RNA with the aranoscope technology? Uh, that's a classic. <laughs> uh, at the moment, no. Uh, the only alternative we have is to use the base scope assay, and you will only be able to detect the pre micro RNA because we need, at least with the base scope assay, we need at least 50 nucleotides to design the probe. Um, next one. Suppose I wanted to do a study of cytokines and tumor tissue associated with a uh, contemporary IHC. Uh, part A, is it possible to carry out a study on multiplex? And B, um, do we have a recommended protocol? Yes, you can do this in multiplex. And uh, then that would definitely recommend the version 2 of the assay for sure. And recommended protocol to combine with immunofluorescence, as I said, uh, we have guidelines, and th those will be the, the efficiency and the success of the combination with, um, will depend on the antibody and the performance of the antibody and how the um, epitope is preserved during the assay. However, if you use cell markers or uh, antibodies that are very robust, it wouldn't be a problem. A lot of people would do RNA scope for cytokines and then have um, uh, immune cells marker as immunofluorescent. This is, this is um, done a lot and is not an issue. Okay, then uh, the question, how do you reduce the auto? <laughs> um, by using version two. <laughs> so uh, we don't reduce the autofluorescence. Basically you cannot because it's, your tissue have this. So basically, if, if, if it's FFP tissue samples, then you cannot reduce because it's intrinsic to your samples. Therefore, the TSA expression makes the signal pops out of this autofluorescence, and then you do not need to expose so long, so basically you do not see the autofluorescence anymore. If you are working with fresh frozen tissue samples, then as I said, you can wash after fixation and uh, increase uh, increase the um, washes after hybridization and amplifier steps, and this usually um, does it helps. Okay, I'm just going. Um Uh, going back to the question with the cytokines in tumor tissues, uh, the person is asking if it would be possible to have a written response. Her audio is not perfect. I think we definitely will follow up with you uh, after the webinar. So um, yeah, 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 sure. I'll here. write you an email. Don't no worry. Okay. <laughs> um, just going back to the Q and A. I think we captured all questions here. Um, just going over. No, I think so. We captured all questions we have in the Q&A, so if you have any more questions, uh, just please type them into the Q&A. Otherwise, um, Morgan, could you bring up your slide with your contact details? So that exactly, we... that's what, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's what I was doing. So if you have any further questions, just contact somehow my computer. Just contact me. Here you go. Here's my phone number or my email. You can also, I'm catching the email from support at ACD Bio. So um, just reach out to me and I'll help you. All right. Thank you for attending the um, webinar and uh, feel free to contact us if you may have any questions.
Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.